This video is brought to you by Let's Get Checked. What's up guys, Michael here. So I just finished the final season of FX's mind-blowing series, Legion, and walked away with, well, a lot of thoughts. And that's a good thing. It's the story of David Haller, an almost all-powerful ESP-fueled mutant who also happens to be a schizophrenic, and it leans hard into the nonsensical, bizarre, and just plain weird. It's got multiple reality-bending scenes, wild off-the-wall musical numbers and dance-offs, and with the addition of season three, time travel. They're also pretty self-aware about it too, with episode recaps often starting like this. Evidently on Legion, ostensibly on Legion. But with so much going on, it's a little hard to pry out one coherent show-defining philosophy, which always gets us asking, is the show smart or does it just think it is? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Welcome to this episode on Legion, Deep or Dumb, and ostensibly, spoilers ahead. But before we get into it, I wanna give a shout out to Let's Get Checked, an at-home testing service with the mission to make health screening open and patient-led. If you're anything like me, you know that it's almost impossible to carve out time to go to the doctor. Their available appointments always seem to be on Wednesday at 2 p.m. on the other side of town. Still, I know how important it is to keep tabs on my health. One test almost everyone I know is afraid to take is a sexual health check. In fact, 51% of people don't get tested for STDs because they don't want to bring up sex with their doctor. Enter Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked offers a variety of general wellness tests for men and women, which includes things like fertility test, hormone test, and STD test. It's really important to make sure that you get tested. And with Let's Get Checked, you can skip that awkward visit to the doctor and do it right from the comfort of your own home. You just go online, order the kit, and will be delivered in a discreet package within a few days. Then you activate it online, follow the instructions, and send back your sample with a prepaid label. Once your results are available online, a Let's Get Check team of physicians and nurses are available to discuss your results on the phone and can prescribe medication when appropriate. You can get your own STD kit or explore all their kit options today by clicking the link in the description or by clicking here. If you use promo code WISECRACK, you can get 20% off. Now, back to the show. First, a quick primer on the show. And yeah, try to keep up. Season one introduces us to David Haller, who his whole life has been told that he's insane. But after being rescued from the government's grasp by a group of like-minded mutants, David learns that he actually has psychic powers and begins training to control his power. The only problem is that a powerful telepath, Amal Farouk, has been lodged in his brain since he was a baby and is now trying to take over his mind. While season one ends with Farouk being kicked out of David's brain, season two focuses on the group trying to kill him. Except not really because we learn that David is actually kind of an evil asshole, not above torturing a friend to get what he wants or raping his girlfriend, Sydney Barrett. And one of television's biggest bait and switches, season two ends with the group befriending Farouk and hunting David. Fast forward a few months where season three picks up. David has decided to live a quiet life as a uh, cult leader for young women with abandonment issues. We. Oui. My people. Your commune. Talking about your commune where you seduce teenage girls with daddy issues. That is, until the time traveler, Switch, arrives. But David's not interested in going back in time and righting his wrong. Instead, he wants to go so far back in time that he stops Amal Farouk from ever inhabiting his brain in the first place. In the process, stopping all the literal madness that has occurred since. The only problem is that Switch's powers aren't fully developed yet. And by going so far back in time, David has angered some seriously creepy baddies. In the Hall of Time, there are demons. In demons? Still, David and Switch keep at it, which causes some disastrous consequences for the present, like, oh right, potentially ending the world. This is how he does it. While Sydney and the others race backwards in time to stop David from doing any more damage, David meets up with his father in the past, telepath Charles Xavier of X-Men fame, and teams up with him to kill Farouk. Except future Farouk joins the mix and convinces Charles that violence isn't the answer. After one touching father-son moment and a slightly less touching but still moving past future Farouk moment, everyone comes to an understanding. I'm saying that war is not the answer. It's the problem. David, we don't need this barbarism. I've made a deal with Farouk. What? Are you saying we just leave? I'm saying that we respect their right to exist and they respect ours, yours. With the past successfully changed, David and Sydney look over the crib at baby David before they both disappear into the ether, having effectively erased their own existences. And scene. Now, if all of that doesn't seem perfectly clear to you, don't panic. 
From the get-go, Legion has always been about challenging the audience's expectations, and season three is no different. Simply put, it's confusing. What does it all mean? Well, here's our two best takes. Idea one, metaphor and metaphysics. In case it wasn't immediately obvious, Legion thrives on an ambiguous sense of reality. Throughout the show's three seasons, we are constantly asking ourselves what is real or true. Is David Holler really David, or is he the host of other personalities inside his head? Who the hell are you? I am Legion. I am Legion. Is Amal Farouk really evil, or is he actually a loving surrogate father? I love the boy Charles. As it turns out, much of this ambiguity stems from the show's unabashed love for metaphors. But when we say metaphor, we're not just talking about simply comparing two things, but a very specific philosophical sense of the word. Borrowing from the work of philosopher Richard Moran, we can say that metaphors create a sense of ambiguity because of the framing effects they produce. In Moran's view, metaphors force people to consider an object or situation in a new light by contrasting it with another. Importantly, this framing isn't fixed, nor is its meaning, and this is where our ambiguity creeps in. When the show calls Farouk a monster, for example, this can mean anything, from the fact that he's technically an alien life form, to the fact that he's incredibly powerful, to the fact that he once trapped a king's mind inside that of a monkey's. By monster, you mean like a metaphor, right? As philosopher Donald Davidson points out, most metaphors don't possess definite meanings any more than dreams do. After all, when Romeo compares Juliet to the sun, there are a million and one different things it could mean, in the same way that dreaming you're naked in front of your high school class could mean both everything and nothing. But what's important here is that by framing Juliet with the sun, we're creating an infinite amount of associations. According to Davidson, just like in dreams, a metaphor's meaning is interpretive. At its best, the dreamlike logic behind metaphors really does drive home how ambiguous Legion's reality really is. Take season two, in which episodes often begin with an educational segment that later contextualizes the action on screen. Psychologists call it a conversion disorder, in that the body converts a mental stress <laughs> to a set of physical symptoms, in this case, a tick or spasm. And, like any disorder, it can be contagious. At first, these segments seem to contextualize our understanding of the various telepathic phenomenon going on in the show. The spread of our teeth-clacking zombies, for example, is compared to the way conversion disorders like laughing fits and mass hysterics have spread throughout history. In another segment, delusions are characterized like parasites, feeding on rational ideas until only they are left. This, in turn, later explains the spread of the delusion among the members of Division Three that an admiral must be killed. Well, I have our rumors, whispers. People go to Admiral Fukuyama's pedestal and they don't come back. What does he do to them? He eats them. It's not gonna happen to us. In both cases, these metaphors seem to contain fairly simple meanings. Madness is contagious and delusion is destructive. But of course, Meaning is a moving target with metaphors, and reality is constantly shifting under your feet in Legion. While we spend a whole season thinking we understand what these metaphors mean, the last episode of season two really rips the rug from underneath our collective feet. The madness that had been spreading, the delusion that had been growing, it was David, and boy, were we wrong. David Heller, your treachery has been discovered. The inevitability of your future crimes. However, while the end of season two might have been a high point for Legion's thematic use of metaphors, season three demonstrates how sometimes the show can collapse under a metaphor's weight. Because let's be real here, some metaphors like dreams make zero sense at all. I think the best example of this would be season three's depiction of the astral plane. As if it was purposefully designed to give us a headache, the astral plane is both a literal and metaphorical place. Amal Farouk at one point gives us this no-nonsense definition of it. Well, at least by Legion standards. This is the astral plane, a world beyond the world, made of pure energy. Very few can see it. Meanwhile, Jemaine, oh, I mean Oliver, tells us that the astral plane is kind of like the island of misfit toys, where broken minds, forgotten truths, and lost objects all collect. We were always finding things. Pens, poetry, socks. 
The astral plane was like a magnet for lost dreams. Minds. That was the other thing we found. In the real world, when people lost their minds, they ended up here. On the surface, we're presented with an interesting problem. How can a metaphorical place where literal lost dreams come true also be a real place? And what does this tell us about the larger logic motivating Legion? Well, one way we could go about this is to assume that both the physical and mental properties are equally real in the show. If thoughts and matter all contain some, for lack of a better word, mental stuff, then it goes a long way in explaining how a metaphorical world like the astral plane can double as a real physical place. So for example, while we might usually think of being heartbroken as an emotional state, in the astral plane, you could literally find the embodiment of your broken heart bleeding out in the street. Don't forget your heart. By having these mental states manifest themselves physically in the astral plane, the show seems to be advocating for a sort of panpsychic doctrine. Distilled into its most basic component, panpsychism holds that the old Cartesian divide between mind and body isn't really a divide at all. Instead, the panpsychist believes that everything from the glass in your smartphone to the neurons in your brain contains fundamental mental elements. Now, before you start worrying that the ground beneath your feet has feelings, panpsychists usually don't commit to the idea that everything has thoughts. Instead, most believe that everything has a mental experience. The mental experience of a human might be quite complex, while that of a fly might be much simpler, and that of a rock would be even more basic. To most panpsychists, mental experience is a fundamental building block of the universe, with actual thought only being achieved by sufficiently complex entities. Applying this model to Legion, we can see how both regular everyday objects and abstract ideas like the loss of innocence appear in the astral plane. They all have a mental experience. It also goes a long way in explaining why David struggles to differentiate between his mind and reality. They're all made of the same mental building blocks. His mind is fixed. His reality is alternate. But while this is an interesting hook into the show, it's hard to say if the show is really using panpsychism or metaphors to make any deeper arguments about the nature of reality or experience. When it comes to panpsychism, the show never seems to really draw out any of the implications of having reality and your mind being both equally real, especially in regards to David. And when it comes to metaphor, it sometimes feels like the show is confusing for the sake of being confusing. Sure, in an oversaturated superhero market, it might be fun to see musical numbers stand in for dialogue. There's only one way this can end. A rap battle. But sometimes we'd like to understand the literal narrative. After all, according to playwright and screenwriter David Mamet, the core of drama is about finding previously unsuspected meaning in chaos, the truth that had been previously obscured by lies. But maybe we should be okay with Legion's uneven use of metaphor. For a show that's so out there in terms of art direction, maybe all the metaphors are just a way to tell an interesting story. Philosophy be damned. Going back to our philosophers, Moran and Davidson, metaphors don't have to necessarily make sense. The important thing is the effect, the framing. And effect seems to be Legion's MO. It's all about that style. So maybe we should forgive the show for pelting us with various dance numbers, loquacious asides. It's about the order of things, the order you learn. When you were young, we let you be wild because wildness is important. But as you got older, we gave you structure so you'd feel safe. And the very weird astral plane. I'm the supine lupine, my libido kills sunshine, moody and spicy like a fine ass toilet wine. Maybe all Legion is trying to do is keep it interesting. So deep, maybe not. Idea two, time and change. Of course, the big shakeup in season three, other than Patonomy's mustache, is the addition of the time traveler, Switch. Now, it might seem unfair to put Legion's depiction of time travel under the microscope. When it comes to comic book characters, we kind of just have to grant the initial premise. Radioactive spiders giving you superpowers instead of cancer? Sure, why not? And early on, Legion playfully reminds us that its depiction of time travel isn't going to trade too heavily on science. What do you know about time travel? I have a PhD in quantum mechanics and a master's in nuclear physics. Have you ever seen the hall? The hall? Time, there's a hallway. It moves in two directions, forwards and back. 
and by drawing a doorway in the air. Like this. I can access the time stream. But there has to be some internal logic going on, right? Well, in Legion's case, not really. In fact, the final season continually fails to address one of the biggest logical problems in time travel, the grandfather paradox. That is, how can time travel be possible if you went back in time, killed your grandfather, and made sure you were never born to go back and kill said grandfather? Now, there are a lot of ways to tackle this problem. You could go the Marvel route and just say no matter what you do while swanning around in the past, the future doesn't change. Time doesn't work that way. Changing the past doesn't change the future. As for Legion, the show's solution can best be summed up as f it. Come at me, bro. Yeah, so David does successfully change his past by keeping his parents together and saving his baby self from Amal Farouk. In doing so, he literally erases his current self. So now what? We just sort of... Fade away into the ether. How does this square with the fact that if David hadn't shared his brain with Farouk for 33 years, he wouldn't have gone back in time in the first place? It doesn't. But maybe Legion isn't trying to make a logical argument about time travel. Maybe this aspect of the story, as trippy and sometimes nonsensical as it is, is in service of a larger message. We're brought back to the idea of metaphor. The beginning of Legion's final episode starts with this text flashing across the screen. This is the end, the beginning, the end. What it all means is not for us to know. It is for history to decide. All we can do is play the parts as written. All we can know is ourselves. On the surface of it, it seems strange for Legion to frame the final episode with a quote. After all, if David and company are just playing their parts as written, how are they supposed to change the past? And what does self-knowledge have to do with, well, anything? But what if this text is a metaphor, asking us to reframe everything we've seen in three seasons according to these words? In this case, the show hints that everything David has done, past and present, from being born to cartoon fighting Amal Farouk, has been necessary. That David needed to quite literally experience time in order for him to change and thereby save the world. And while it might seem like we're reaching here, this theory does fit with the rest of the show. In fact, the idea that characters needed to experience time to change is integral to all our major players' arc. Sid, for example, must live a second childhood in the astral plane. Under the watch of Oliver and Melanie, she goes from being the understandably rage-filled girl shooting her rapist to a kick-ass, self-actualized woman who knows how to save the world. I know, honey. But here's the thing. The real world needs you. All those bad things, they don't have to be bad. They can be fixed. Likewise, the 30 plus years Amal Farouk spent in David's head has changed him. I saw what he saw. I felt what he felt. I thought what he thought. And over time, what was once a prison became a person. When present Farouk finally sizes up his past self, he can barely contain the contempt for the person he once was. Bonson. You have become soft in your old age. <laughs> was I really this bitter, filled with hate? How petty you seem. But what about David? Does he really change? According to our girl Sid, there's no saving the present David. He's broken goods. David, adult David, we can't save him. He's too far gone. But a baby? This baby? Him we can save. So how does time help David change? Quite literally by unwriting his existence. Listen to this narration David gives in the beginning of the final episode. Again, it serves to reframe everything we've seen up to this point in the show. Lessons in time travel, chapter zero. Who we were does not dictate who we will be. But often, it's a pretty good indication Time travel does not give one the opportunity to change oneself, but rather to eradicate oneself.
and allow something else to form in the wake of what once was. In other words, change for David could only come through destruction, and he can only achieve that destruction by messing with time. It's madness, and it's a complete twist on how other characters experience time in order to change, but madness is David's MO. Finally, in the closing minutes of the show, Legion seems to suggest that there's almost a cosmic plan to this change, whether it's Sidney's second childhood or David's suicide gamble. When Switch dies in the final episode, it's revealed that she's not human at all, but quite literally the embodiment of time itself. How do you know? I'm time. When Switch returns back to Earth, she lets everyone know that there was meaning to the change they underwent, that Switch, as an embodiment of time in the universe itself, has validated them. Sidney Barrett, Gabriel Xavier, and the infant David. The universe acknowledges you, that you exist, and that your existence is important. I can see that you've suffered that people you love have suffered. And you want to know that it meant something. It did. It does. Nothing of value is ever lost. And even though the present them will perish, it was also better versions of themselves shall flourish in their place. So what do we make of Legion's take on time and change? Again, I think it's best to invoke Davidson's work on metaphor here. As Davidson rightly points out, how many facts are conveyed by a photograph? None, an infinity, or one great unstatable fact? Bad question. A picture is not worth a thousand words, or any other number. Words are the wrong currency to exchange for a picture. In the same way, holding Legion's take on time and change to a philosophical standard might not be the right approach. At the end of the day, Noah Hawley decided to not make a philosophical argument with the show, but rather an artistic one. And like in time travel, in this choice, there is a sort of grace or madness. Whatever deeper meaning there is here, if any at all, the show's not giving us any hints. Overall, we give Legion a five out of 10 for smarts, but hey, maybe we're just not getting it. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace.